ESPN is proud to present this commercial-free telecast of Sports Figures, supporting education for America's youth. The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable communications industry and your local cable company. Hi, I'm Chris McKendry. Welcome to ESPN Sports Figures, the only place on television where you'll hear X Games street luge medalist Darren Lott say, Whoa! Or Olympic figure skater Sasha Cohen say, The angular momentum is determined by inertia and speed. ESPN Sports Figures, where sports and science go one on one. Let's join Marissa Copeland with Darren Lott. Sports figures, put your brain in the game. about the speed limit for a street luge, but they're not written in any traffic codes or posted on any signs. See, in physics, there are laws about the top speed any object can go. We're talking terminal velocity. Uh, well, sure, if you go too fast in a turn, that's a kind of terminal velocity. But the terminal velocity we're talking about is the top speed a falling object can go. And a luge is a falling object. To help us take a look, we've got Darren Lott. He's been street luging since the late 70s. He's also an X Games medalist, and he's run races worldwide. He also holds the Guinness Book of World Records record for fastest butt border. That's what they call it, at 65 miles an hour. And he wrote the book on the subject, The Street Luge Survival Guide. So he knows a thing or two about velocity. You know, Darren, people think you're nuts, right? I mean, it's also got to be a little dangerous, yes? Well, sort of the irony is, is that street luge or lay down skateboarding developed to try to go down hills in a safer way on a skateboard. So we've got the gear, the rolling gear that'll handle it. We dress in leathers. So we're sort of set up for a road racing motorcycle crash. If you use the proper equipment, it can be very safe. But it's still not for your uh, basic golfer type, is it? I like golf. <laughs> Tell me, what's the fastest a luge can go? Well, on most race courses, the speeds don't get much over 60 miles an hour. Uh -huh. That's because the roads are twisty mountain roads where you have to brake, you're sliding to get through the turns. 
Uh, the very fastest on the racing circuit, it goes a little over 70 miles an hour, but on a fairly straight road, the Guinness World Record was set at 81 and a half miles an hour. Wow, do you think that record will ever be broken? Oh, absolutely. Maybe, maybe not. We know that when we drop something, gravity pulls it down, right? That's called acceleration due to gravity, and it's got a number. Thanks to Isaac Newton, we know that an object accelerates by 9.8 meters per second every second it's in the air. So, the higher up I drop something, the longer it falls and the faster it will go. That makes sense, right? So, let's say I dropped a baseball from up here at 5,000 feet. By the time the ball gets here, it's going about 95 miles per hour. That's about as fast as a big league pitch. It's fast, but not that fast. But let's say I dropped the baseball from way up here at 10,000 feet. <laughs> from 10,000 feet, the ball will be traveling about five miles per hour. But how is that possible? If gravity is accelerating the ball 9.8 meters for every second that it's in the air, a ball traveling from 10,000 feet will be falling a lot longer than a ball from 5,000 feet. How can it be going the same speed? OK, but what about Isaac Newton? I mean, how can the ball end up at the same speed? Newton was talking about objects falling in a vacuum, like in outer space or something. Is it because of the air? Ah, what about the air? Well, there's air resistance. Yeah, and what do we call air resistance? Drag. Drag slows things down. Like this sign is catching so much air, I'm hardly moving at all. I gotta get a new sponsor. Any object passing through a fluid experiences drag. See, air is a fluid when it comes to physics. If I drop this ball, it experiences drag through the air, but it's so minimal, it's hard to see. But in the water, it's easy to see the effect of drag. Water is denser than air. But here's the important part. The water slows the ball until it finally reaches a speed where it stops accelerating. Eventually, it sinks at a constant speed. That speed is a golf ball's terminal velocity in water. OK, so this is all pretty obvious, right? It's like if I drop a feather. It accelerates for a really short time. Then it reaches a constant speed, terminal velocity. Why does it reach terminal velocity so quickly? It has to do with its weight compared to its surface area. Right, because the feather, compared to its weight, has a relatively large surface area. When an object first starts falling, its speed isn't fast enough for drag to be a major factor, so it accelerates, goes faster and faster. But as it goes faster, the drag force increases until it reaches a point where it equals the force of gravity pulling the weight down. This results in an equilibrium, where the object stops accelerating. It won't fall any faster. It's reached terminal velocity. So what about a heavier object with a smaller surface area, like a luge? A heavier object with the same or lesser surface area will fall faster than the lighter one. But everything has a terminal velocity. It'll just be a little faster. If we ignore air resistance, drag, or if it's so small that it's really nothing to worry about, then all objects fall at the same rate. But if drag is a factor, like with this volleyball and this basketball. They both have about the same surface area, but the basketball weighs a lot more. Look, the basketball is falling faster. Because of its greater weight, it has to go faster before there's enough drag to equal gravity's pull. OK, Darren, so you guys want to present as little surface area to the air as possible. So what do you guys do? In order to be faster, you got to get your feet tucked down low. You got to get your elbows in and your head as low as possible. All right. When we look at drag, we use an equation that looks like this. D, drag force, equals K, constant. Uh, now, I know that constant begins with a C, but in physics, we use a K, OK? And we're going to talk more about the constant later, but for now, you just need to know that it's a number that remains the same. It's constant. 
times A area times B velocity, and it's squared. Now that squared is a really big deal. The surface area that Darren presents to the air looks like this. So Darren, you don't have a lot of surface area to slow you down. But we have a lot of speed, and that ends up slowing us down. Right, it's kind of weird, right? But your speed actually slows you down more than the surface area. But how can speed slow you down? The faster the luge goes, the greater the number of air molecules it encounters, and the greater the force of the air's impact. That's why velocity squared is such a big thing. It means that if your velocity doubles, drag force quadruples. And if your velocity triples, the drag force increases by a factor of nine. So the faster you go, the more effect drag has on you. And it keeps growing and growing until drag's force equals gravity's force on your weight. And you stop accelerating. So Darren, besides drag, what has the greatest effect on your terminal velocity? The weight of the object. So would the heaviest rider with the heaviest board have the greatest terminal velocity? Not necessarily. A heavier rider is probably bigger and presents a larger surface area to the wind. Also, the extra weight causes the wheels to deform against the road, which creates more friction. Right, the road. But at the highest speeds, this sport's all about wind. OK, so for our purposes, let's just deal with air friction. OK, so what about this k, the constant in our equation? What's that all about? Well, I'll give you a hint. Part of it is the leather a loser wears. That could be the surface drag, how smooth or rough the surface is that the air passes over. Right. Part of our constant is the drag coefficient. That's the number that says how easily air passes over a surface. Like, say you went losing in this outfit. The furry surface would have a way higher coefficient of drag than the smooth surface of leathers. OK, what else could make up this constant besides the surface? What else affects drag force? I'll give you a hint. Water. The density of the air? Right. But air is just air. Not so. Unless you think of it as compared to space, where there is no air, then it really does seem a lot closer to water and thickness. On Earth, the air's density changes a lot from place to place. Out here at sea level, the air is a lot heavier, a lot denser per volume than it would be up in the mountains. You know how it's harder to breathe up in the mountains? That's because the air is less dense. So if you're losing up in the mountains, you can have a higher terminal velocity. Also, air temperature affects air density a lot. Colder air is much denser than warmer air. So a hot day in the mountains is going to be your fastest luge run. Without atmosphere or friction, there is no terminal velocity in space. Well, Actually, there is the speed of light, but that's a whole other topic. So when do we figure out Darren's terminal velocity? Well, see, because of the complexities of the drag coefficient and your density, figuring out the exact terminal velocity is a little complicated for us to go into right now. But we can take a look at how it works. right? In an equation, it looks like this. My mass times gravity equals drag force. So to solve for velocity, we need to divide both sides by Ka to get mg divided by Ka equals velocity squared. So terminal velocity is the square root of gravity's force divided by Ka. A skydiver in this position presents about the same surface area as a loser. My terminal velocity will reach about 200 miles per hour in 10 to 15 seconds. If I didn't pull my chute cord, that's the same speed I would be going all the way to the ground. In that case, 
It really would be terminal velocity. So Darren, could a street luge go 200 miles per hour? There's a lot of reasons why it couldn't be that fast. So based on what we know, what is the terminal velocity for street luge? With the current technology on racing luges today, probably not much faster than in the high 80s. If you add some aerodynamic aids, some different wheels, you're pushing up into that 90 mile an hour region. But the holy grail for the street lugers seems to be 100 miles an hour. 100 miles per hour. That's fast. It brings up another equation we haven't talked about, which is I equals V to the H. Oh, really? What's the I? Inertia? Injury. Injury, oh. And uh, V must be velocity. What's the H? That's the hospital factor. A crash that you have on your skateboard at 20 miles an hour in front of your house skins you up and will make you sore for a month. At 60... You're in traction. It's bad. Oh, man. OK, guys, so what did we learn? That all objects falling through a medium will have a terminal velocity. And that velocity is determined by drag. When drag force equals the pull of gravity, the weight of an object, it stops accelerating. And drag force is determined by surface area and velocity. But figuring out terminal velocity is really complicated. Complicated, yes, but very important if you want to win. If you want to get further into terminal velocity, visit our website at sportsfigures.espn.com. Well, that's it. We'd like to thank Darren Lott Whoa. and our students from Carlsbad High, Andy, Dusty, Lila, and Emily, for helping us out here today on ESPN Sports Figures Terminal Velocity. Of course, you know this is all an illusion. <laughs> We'd like to thank all of today's athletes for donating their time, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on ESPN Sports Figures. ESPN Sports Figures is presented commercial free for educators to take and use in the classroom. For a free teacher's curriculum, to order the Sports Figures series, or if you have questions or comments, visit our website, sportsfigures.espn.com. You can also call 860-766-2000. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Sports figures, put your brain in the game. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable communications industry and your local cable company. ESPN is proud to present this commercial-free telecast of sports figures, supporting education for America's youth.